it is such a privilege to have you with us today. Such an honor. Um, General, you've also always been a great friend to World Affairs Councils around the country, um, and you still hold the record attendance at our council. Um, so, <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how are your family staying safe, uh, staying safe during this time? Well, we're doing great in our readout here in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, we're happy to have the family dog with us for the duration. Uh, she feels like she's in boot camp with all of the walks during calls and Zoom sessions when I don't actually have to appear. So, no, it's going fine. And thanks for mentioning the attendance number. Not that I'm in the least bit competitive, but it's always nice to remember that. But you still hold it and, and, and others haven't, haven't come nearly close. So thank you so much. Um, so as we sit here today in the middle of a COVID crisis, you know, 3.5 million people around the world, um, you know, tested and confirmed with COVID, over, you know, 251,000 deaths, uh, you know, a million confirmed, over a million confirmed cases here in the U.S. Um, and the world today is starting to sort of relax and ease restrictions, yet we're still in the middle of crisis. Um, and one of the things that you've always been so prolific in is the role of leadership. Um, and so when we're looking at leadership today and leadership in crisis, um, how important is the role of that leader and are there historical lessons that we can learn? Well, leadership is always crucial. I think it's particularly crucial though during tough times. And that's especially the case of strategic leadership. So a strategic leader is the person literally at the top of the entire organization, unit, enterprise. It's the commander of the surge in Iraq or the surge in Afghanistan. Uh, and strategic leaders, uh, again, whether it's Netflix or multinational force Iraq, have to perform four tasks very, very well for the enterprise to succeed. The first of those is they have to get the big ideas right. Usually this is an iterative, inclusive, uh, open and transparent process. Uh, these big ideas don't usually hit you on the head like Newton's apple fully formed if you sit under the right tree. Rather, they, you get hit on the head by a kernel or a seed of a big idea. And then you have to shape it into its full fashion, full form. So again, you have to absolutely get the big ideas right. And we can talk about those in this case in a moment if you want. Having gotten those right, you have to communicate throughout the breadth and depth of the organization. I mean, if you're the president, you have to do it throughout the breadth and depth of a country. Uh, same for a prime minister in, in other cases. Um, and then the third task is you have to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. This is literally driving a campaign forward. It's Again, what I did as the commander of the surge in Iraq, where the surge that mattered most wasn't the surge of forces, it was the surge of ideas, the, the change in strategy that was literally 180 degrees in most respects from what we have been doing. Having gotten those big ideas, and we've been fortunate, a number of us to have served there already uh, by that time, by well over two years, uh, and we'd spent the previous 15 months in the States codifying them, capturing them, institutionalizing them, then it was a task to communicate them throughout the breadth and depth of that organization and then to oversee their implementation. That involves everything from how you spend your own time, uh, hiring the best team you can get, inspiring energy, example, metrics, because you again, you have to really pay attention to the numbers that tell you whether you are winning or losing and that allow you to take certain actions when certain thresholds and certain standards are reached. And then there's a fourth task that sometimes is overlooked, as in the case of General Elect or of uh, uh, Kodak. I'm sorry, uh, Kodak, unbeknownst to a lot of people, actually had over two uh, two thousand, I think it was, uh, patents on digital photography, and yet they they failed to make the change quickly enough. They didn't sit down in task number four, which is to determine how to refine the big ideas, to change them, to bring in new ones, and then to do it all over again and again and again. So strategic leadership is always important, but it's especially important when an organization confronts a crisis, uh, has to take significant change, and certainly the response to the pandemic, which has also brought about an economic collapse, uh, requires a complete set of big ideas to enable us to move forward properly. So thank you. So let's move on to like uh, global leadership for a minute. So many have argued that the U.S. currently is abdicating its global leadership role. Um, and how does this impact the global recovery from COVID-19? 
Well, in an ideal world, and I hope that we can reach an ideal world, uh, the leaders in particular of the two greatest countries in that world, the U.S. and China, uh, would again put aside the accusations that have been sent back and forth, however uh, merited some of them may be. Let's put that in the rearview mirror for a moment and figure out how to move forward together. Uh, this is a global pandemic and a global economic crisis, and you therefore need a global solution. Uh, it's not an overstatement, I don't think, to say that no one of us is safe uh, if all of us are not safe in a global situation like this. So those two countries, in the G7, the G20, uh, certainly working with the World Health Organization, uh, our experts with them, along with the other experts of other countries, um, and determining, again, how to get out of this. Uh, again, I think there are numerous big ideas that are largely accepted, uh, and those are that when community transmission of the virus uh, has taken place, you've got to break that. And the way to do that is what we have all been doing uh, in the last month or month and a half in the United States by and large, which is to shelter in place, to stay home if at all possible, so to minimize uh, social contact, to implement physical distancing, to wear a mask when in public places where that may not be possible. Um, and to do that for such a period of time that is, so many of the experts have said you flatten the curve. It doesn't get as bad as was expected, which means that the health services and so forth can deal with the challenges. And then once you've had, according to the White House guidelines, also shared in the National Governors Association, the Harvard, Safra Center, and others, they all generally agree that after about 14 days of a downward trend in the number of infections that's measured, then you can gradually relax some of the restrictions in a thoughtful manner, still maintaining physical distancing, still probably wearing masks in public places, uh, the most vulnerable probably still staying at home and so forth. And a little bit like putting your foot into water, you put your toe in and then if it doesn't feel right, you might take it out, make some adjustments, put a little bit more of your body in, make some adjustments until you're fully immersed again. The challenge in this case, of course, is that, again, if there is this virus anywhere in the world, we've got to be very, very careful that it doesn't get retransmitted back into the United States, assuming that we can make the kind of progress that we all hope we will see over time. Noting that, you know, to recall the question that I asked in the beginning, very early days of the fight to Baghdad as a young two-star general, tell me how this ends, as it was becoming increasingly clear that the assumptions we'd been provided prior to the march up to Baghdad, as we termed it, were being invalidated one by one. In this case, tell me how this ends is answered by when you get a vaccine and or a therapeutic treatment uh, that establishes sufficient confidence that people can go about most of what we know as normal, noting that it could take years to get to a new normal, and it's possible that the new normal is very different from the old normal. So if we were looking and in assuming that we wanted the, that the U.S. should um, assume a greater global leadership role in the post-COVID-19 world, how would you suggest we go about expanding the influence and where would some of our priorities be? Well, again, I think that what you would do is you work with the leading countries, again, as usual, it's with the G7, uh, also US-China, ultimately the G20, um, using international organizations, knowing that they can be frustrating, they have shortcomings, uh, there are reasons to be, you know, at various times, uh, again, quite frustrated with what goes on, having worked in a number of uh, coalitions and international organizations, but at the end of the day, they're hugely valuable. Um, you know, Churchill used to say about allies, he said, the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. And he was very right. And having commanded a coalition in combat, one of which was over 60 countries, I can tell you it took an awful lot of effort time to do the, the management, if you will, uh, of that coalition. Um, but it was worth it. Sustaining that coalition is hugely valuable. That is especially true again, when you have a global pandemic and a global economic downturn. And, and there will have to be coordinated actions. There should be lots of sharing 
uh, of lessons that are being learned about how to dramatically increase testing. Keep in mind that the number of tests per day that is desirable, according to most of these different documents, uh, is about 5 million per day by June. Um, we're still at somewhere around 250,000 per day. Again, testing is going to be the key, along with then uh, contact tracing that uses the results of those tests to find out wh who the individuals who are positive had contact with, uh, so that you can then have selective isolation rather than community isolation to keep this from taking back off. Um, I think you know, a lot of the experts right now are expressing some concerns about the fact that there are states and regions that are relaxing restrictions before they've had the requisite down days. And again, we'll have to see how that transpires because the, the recovery is not going to be a V. Again, it's not bouncing right back the way it did roughly after the Great Recession, let's say in 2008, 2009, once liquidity was, was restored to the markets. At best, it's going to be a U, an elongated U. You want to get that elongated part as vertical as you can, but it's going to take time. Um, you don't want it to be a W or a jagged recovery where what happens is, is you open up and then the numbers spike again and you have to lock down an entire community again to block community transmission. And the key to, to enabling you to re reduce restrictions safely is a massive regime of testing, again, at that level that I said in June, and it could be much, much more. Uh, it's, not, it's not out of the realm of the possible to dream that there will at some point be some kind of digital app that will give us a measure. It's being experimented with in China, the red, amber, green, and to get on a train or a plane or some other public uh, conveyance, you're going to have to show your app and you're either green or you have to walk, I guess. But again, that's not completely fantasy, I don't think, if you see a recurrence again or a series of spikes of community transmission, noting the hope of what as well, of course, is that the reinfection rate does go down gradually as the amount of heat goes up, although there are certainly plenty of countries in much hotter climates where the virus seems to be transmitting uh, terrifyingly well. So let's talk about that economic recovery for a second. So as the world looks to sort of start to, to recover, what um, from a global recession, what are some of the ways we can build a stronger, more resilient national and international economy um, you know, in the face of COVID-19? Well, again, the key to recovery at all, um, I'm not just talking about a more resilient or more whatever, uh, economy, the key to just basic economic recovery, noting that there is going to be a shakeout and that not all jobs are going to come back, but there will be new jobs uh, created. So this is going to be a period of difficult transition for many economies uh, of the world. But to get the economy coming back requires confidence, because keep in mind that it's one thing for a governor to say, you can reopen your coffee shops, your restaurants, your barber shops. Uh, it's another for customers to actually walk in those doors. And that will be determined by the confidence that they have uh, and whether or not, again, that confidence gives them the, the reason to do as frequently as they used to, uh, whatever it is that they used to do, going out to eat, again, having a haircut, uh, getting hair done, all of these normal activities that we went about without thinking about them and ha have now gone without, the key to that is going to be confidence, and confidence comes when you truly drive the numbers down and you have a regime in place because of massive testing and very substantial contact tracing capabilities that you're not worried that, that everyone you run into out there uh, is going to be transmitting the virus. Keep in mind that you, the key here is the R rate, and the R is the reinfection rate. And the idea is to drive that down below one, well below one, so that each person is not reinfecting one or more, which is, is the challenge. That's what happens when community transmission uh, is ongoing. So it's really about how do you get confidence back into the market? Um, again, think about the devastating impact this has had on a variety of different industries, not the least of which are those in the hospitality and tourism markets, 
Um, again, the key is going to be people are confident. And beyond that, the international tourism and business travel, um, you don't want to end up getting quarantined for 14 days going to or from uh, that destination. So all of these kinds of uh, situations, which we used to take for granted, again, we're going to have to regain confidence that we can go about these activities, uh, again, without the fear of uh, contracting the virus. So we know that crisis can often be a time of great innovation um, and great opportunity. Do you predict or do you think we can see some great innovations or some transformational things coming, coming from this? this <laughs> Absolutely, sure. Um, just look at the number of people who are using Zoom these days. And by the way, again, you know, I've, <laughs> I've now experienced that you can run but not hide from Zoom. I mean, I used to have a ready-made excuse. I'll do the event in Mumbai the next time I'm in India, which wouldn't be for six months. Or I'll do the, okay, when I get to Germany, we'll do that stiff tongue in Berlin. Well, last week I did Mumbai and Berlin and a handful of U.S. cities all in the same week because of this technology. And there will be many offshoots. Uh, from this, certainly. But more importantly, I think there will be an awful lot of innovations that are connected to how do we regain the confidence, which ultimately uh, would come when you get a vaccine. Keep in mind the fastest vaccine development in history is four years. This is going to be vastly quicker. I mean, there are literally a hundred or so initiatives, the first of which 6,000 people will be tested in June by a, an Oxford initiative. So again, this is going to be very, very significant, as well as the therapeutic treatment, as well as tests that can be read immediately. Again, think what a, what a tremendous breakthrough it will be and step forward for that confidence. If you can give yourself a test uh, on the way to the office that day, and I don't know, you can show your digital credential that I am COVID-19 free and they let you up to the 41st floor, uh, in Nine West, you know, which I haven't seen again in six weeks now. Um, so there will be huge innovation. And I think there will be a number of different uh, ongoing initiatives that will get a huge boost from this. Think of telemedicine. Um, think of conducting surgery, uh, again, remotely. Uh, all of these are going to get, because we've had to uh, reduce the normal amount of travel um, and indeed reduce the normal amount of time we spend outside our houses unless we are literally on the front lines of this endeavor. Um, and, and, and God bless every one of those. But all of this is going to lead to, I think, again, to enormous innovation and all kinds of uh, startups that are connected to this, even as perhaps some other industries uh, will go through a very significant shakeout. So we know that the pandemic has demonstrated the fragility in the, in the U.S. defense industrial base. So going forward, what are some of your thoughts on ways to sort of strengthen that base um, to ensure the U.S. can respond to global threats appropriately in the future? Well, first of all, I don't know that the pandemic has demonstrated um, fragility in the defense industrial base. I would contend that that was, if, if there is that, it's a pre-existing condition. And I think you are probably right. Uh, General Mattis and others have, have commented that the medium-sized defense firms in particular, um, because they're bought up by the big, huge primes, and again, with all due respect for those primes and with gratitude for all that they provided to us on the battlefield, they're not always the source of the kind of cutting-edge innovation initiative and agility that you can find, again, understandably in startups or again, beyond startups uh, in the medium-sized firms. There are far fewer of those out there uh, than used to be. We look at these in, in my uh, business and in, in the investment world. Um, and it's been fascinating to see uh, the primes buy these up um, and they are incredibly agile and then it's a bit less so. Now, again, some of that's understandable because the primes are producing these major end items. I mean, there's nothing more major than an aircraft carrier. And that's not a place where you're going to see, you know, innovation year on year necessarily. But in a lot of these other areas, that's exactly what we do need. I've been heartened to see some spring up actually in the course of the past year or two and, and led by 
uh, very talented entrepreneurs who have already proven themselves by building and selling uh, multi-billion dollar companies. So the question I think is what more can be done to uh, encourage more of the primes uh, and to give them uh, sources of funding and incentives uh, to really push the envelope in innovation, in entrepreneurial activities, that is the key. And again, you know that all the different areas in which this is taking place. It's everything from uh, an entirely new battle space in cyberspace um, or hypersonics, uh, unmanned everything, robotics, uh, enabled by machine learning and artificial intelligence. All of these different arenas are truly brave new worlds. And as you look at potential battlefields of the future, uh, they are truly very, very different from what we saw even in the, the years that I was privileged to uh, be on those battlefields in the post 9-11 era. So thank you. So let's um, sort of take a step back and look at the global big, uh, big picture. Uh, what do you see as some of the biggest national and global security threats on, and concerns that we're facing now because of COVID-19? Well, the, the traditional list, I think, for a number of years now has included uh, the resurgence of great power rivalries. Um, some of these which are a bit paradoxical because you have China, which is, to be sure, our biggest strategic competitor, but until the tariffs were imposed, was also our biggest trading partner. Um, and so that's a very, very uh, delicate relationship, but certainly the incredible rise and growth and development of China, unprecedented uh, in economic terms in particular. Uh, when you think back to where China was 41 years or so ago when Deng Xiaoping welcomed the world to China and where it is now, and by the way, there's a museum, they redid the museum in Beijing, the National Museum, for a 40-year exhibit, and I went through it, and it truly was nothing short of mind-blowing to contrast where they were in various sectors and where they are now. Um, the resurgence of Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin's goals to try to restore the Soviet uh, empire or the Russian empire, whatever it may be. You have other countries that are so-called revisionist powers or even revolutionary powers. They're not satisfied with the status quo. That's always uh, very challenging and indeed dangerous. This would be Iran, North Korea. Um, you have still uh, Islamist extremists that are causing big problems around the world and for which we need a sustained, sustainable commitment, which I would contend we have actually been able to develop uh, in places like Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan and the Horn of Africa and others. Um, you also have a huge escalation of cyber threats. Um, indeed, just in the last couple of months, those have skyrocketed as all of us are doing far more of this uh, and far less uh, in-person meetings and conferences and briefings. And so that's, a, again, a brave new world. And we've seen countries seek to influence our election, as Russia did clearly in the previous presidential election. Uh, we have seen other countries try to raise money out of this. North Korea uh, has a huge effort to gain uh, hard currency through cyber theft. You've seen uh, the extremists use cyberspace to recruit uh, fighters, um, support money to proselytize, to share tactics, techniques, and procedures of terrorism. Um, and you've seen uh, cyber thieves uh, gather so much in the course of a single year now that they would be a top 10 economy if you actually aggregated it, because it's way over a trillion, some say it's trillions of dollars uh, every year. Uh, then there's a variety of others, and some of these include the uh, questions in the United States about the value of globalism, about multilateral organizations, international institutions, uh, the norms, the even whether the U.S. should continue to lead the so-called rules-based international order, or if that's not all it's cracked up to be. Uh, you see democracies around the world experiencing populism. Um, all of those threats, and then you would add in uh, the ones that are often overlooked until right now, which would be human security threats, and that would certainly be the pandemic, it would be climate change, and, and a variety of other challenges that are out there as well. So 
it's a we're, we often describe this as the most complex array of threats and challenges since the end of the Cold War. I think it is now even more so uh, given this latest challenge, which is truly a, a once in a century, if not longer, experience for us. So let's uh, talk about the election for a second. So looking at the upcoming election, do you believe that our current crisis has left us uh, more vulnerable to outside influence? Um, and what are some of the things we should be most concerned about? I don't know if it's the crisis that makes us more vulnerable. I think just the fact that um, so many people are spending so much time uh, on social media uh, in particular, and that, that it carries an inherent degree of vulnerability with it because there are those who are out there trying to influence uh, what is on social media, as the Russians did very, very effectively. Uh, in the previous presidential election, and as the intelligence community has said, they are attempting to do again. So uh, again, whether that is associated with the pandemic, I would say that that's a pre-existing condition that arguably is made more difficult because of the pandemic and the fact that we are all using vastly more bandwidth than we ever dreamed of using uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, but it's just a fact of life, I think. And, and there will be those who are going to try to hack into databases, might even hack into the actual voting counting, depending on how that is done, and certainly will try to influence and perhaps put a finger on the scale of the election as the intelligence community uh, agreed was done in the previous election. So thank you. So we're going to switch to some um, audience questions. And I want to encourage everyone to use the Q&A function on your screen. Um, but I'll, I want to start off with a question from Bud Buka, who was uh, originally going to get our Luminary Award this week. Uh, we'll have to do that a little bit later on in the, in the, in the year. Um, but General, from, from Bud, uh, with the burden of COVID-19 virus commanding the attention of leaders from all walks of life and around the globe, how can our military leadership, who's, uh, who's, who's, uh, honor, who's, how can our military, whose leadership is based on the foundation of honor, continue to lead when others in the chain of command pursue a philosophy of anything goes as long as the commander in chief is praised? Well, first of all, let me just say hi to Bud. And you know, he's one of my heroes. You all well know that he earned the Medal of Honor and the division that I was privileged to command. Actually, the battalion I also commanded earlier, um, obviously a few decades after he served in, in Vietnam. Um, he is a true American hero, and, and I've always treasured the friendship that we have had, even including him teaching in the department that I ultimately taught in at West Point. Um, look, I think uh, our military leadership is absolutely intent on being what we have always tried to be, which is as nonpartisan and nonpolitical as is possible, uh, to cling to the touchstones, the values, the principles, and so forth. Uh, that we've always held dear, and again, to drive on and to tell, tell truth to power and all the rest of this stuff. And I think that um, our chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, in recent administrations have done that very effectively, um, and, I th and I'm confident that they will continue to do just that. Um, you can see this in a variety of the different cases that are out there, uh, those that have risen to uh, public notice. And uh, it's very clear to me that the, the uniform leadership uh, is intent on doing that. And by the way, I think it's very clear that Secretary Esper uh, is intent on doing the same. Um, so the next question is from a cadet at West Point who's about to graduate and is asking you for advice. What would you tell him to do today? Um, first of all, of course, he's not a cadet at West Point. He actually is a U.S. Military Academy cadet at home, I suspect. <laughs> um, and they will come back together, I guess, to gather all their belongings um, in a very, it's a very phased activity that they've designed for them to do that. And then one of the events of that will then be to have, with physical distancing, uh, have a graduation ceremony uh, as similar to what the uh, Air Force Academy had. Uh, gosh. I can probably even imagine who this might be. Um, you should ask him if his first name is Jeff, but. Uh, it's actually David, so. Oh, okay, it's actually one who hasn't been 
<coughs> on LinkedIn with me. Um, you know, the advice I've always given, and you know, there's the obvious stuff about truly master your profession. I mean, don't worry about it. Do certainly subscribe to the Global Affairs Council and Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy, but actually focus really on, if you're an instrument as an example, on FM 7-8 and 710, you know, the infantry squad platoon and then and company and just absolutely, truly no kidding master these. But that's the obvious. And then, you know, be so fit that you can lead from the front no matter what the task is. Uh, give energy, listen to your non-commissioned officers, uh, don't be untransmit. All of the, these are sort of common sense. The advice that I've given at times, which is a little bit different, uh, is to seek out of your intellectual comfort zone experiences during your career, because you're, you're sort of out of time to do that still as a cadet about to graduate uh, in a few weeks. And here I'm talking about, and I tried to do this. Um, you know, as an infantry officer, I sought to go to the Armor Officer Advanced Course, uh, strange as that was. And, um, and the way I ensured I could do that is I did the infantry one by correspondence. So when I got my orders in the mail for the infantry school, I said, ah, excuse me, you know, I've, I've already done that one. How about the armor one? They said, oh, okay, fine. Um, you know, instead of doing the war college, I actually went to a fellowship. Instead of doing completing the fellowship, I deployed to Haiti to be the chief of operations for the United Nations force there, truly out of my intellectual comfort zone experience and an incredibly developing one. I mean, at one point, I had a choice between the Ranger Regiment and graduate school and I chose graduate school and I was told that I was committing professional suicide and you know for a few years there I wondered whether that might prove right but you know managed to survive that and I contend that that developmental experience of two years at Princeton was just invaluable so again you must master the actual tasks uh, of your position and branch and profession but assuming you've got that, then it's the out of your intellectual comfort zone experiences that often provide you that little something extra that when you're all of a sudden in Mosul, Iraq, uh, without even having maps for the place until 12 hours prior as your topographic engineers are printing them because we weren't supposed to go there. This is when I was a division commander of the 101st Airborne Division. Um, that you have a sense of how to operate and all of a sudden you're an occupying force commander responsible for everything uh, in northern Iraq. Uh, all eyes turn to you and you actually have some sense about this is how we might go about it. No, by the way, I've already dealt with people um, who are seriously bright, whose views are quite different from mine and get used to it. That's the way the world is. So I have a, uh, here's a question about the refugee crisis, the global crisis that we're facing, what do you think the U.S. Uh, responsibility should be to the international refugee crisis and dislocation during, um, during uh, the post-COVID-19 rebuilding? Well, first of all, just to put this in context, um, this crisis was so significant that the previous administration ultimately felt it had to go into Syria uh, because that particular crisis was being caused by and large by the Islamic State. Then it started to pose an actual security threat to Europe. But again, you look at a country like Syria in which half the population has been displaced and half of that half has been displaced outside the country, millions of which have ended up in Europe. And that populism that I discussed earlier that has presented the biggest challenge to the democracies of our NATO allies is a result of that refugee flow, plus some certainly from North Africa that have been very substantial at times and, and from some other locations as well, Iraq, Afghanistan, perhaps, and some others. So this is a truly serious threat. It's a security threat because at the end of the day, uh, you've got to be able to assimilate and deal with and take in. It's a humanitarian uh, crisis of the first order. Now, all of that, which already existed, will be made worse, I fear, by the pandemic uh, because the emerging economies of the world don't have anywhere near the fiscal and monetary firepower that the U.S. and the developed economies of the world have. I mean, our Fed has thrown trillions of dollars of liquidity at the markets. Our Congress and Treasury and the White House have appropriated nearly three times 
our annual discretionary budget in the course of a month um, to ensure that there is something uh, that, to catch those who are uh, being left jobless and unemployed at the highest level since the Great Depression. Many of the developing world economies, the emerging market economies, do not have that wherewithal. In fact, a number of them have, again, pre-existing financial conditions where they were already in a very tough spot with a lot of dollar-denominated debt uh, in a very difficult place. And their currency is, of course, depreciating relative to the dollar, so it'll be more, more expensive to pay back, even with US interest rates uh, at just about zero. So again, if you want to come out of this, um, you need a global solution. And that comes back to the very beginning where we talked about global crises require global solutions. And again, the wealthier countries of the world are going to have to share some of that. Or the difference between the haves and have nots will be so great that you may have actual unrest uh, that causes a whole new set of problems. Here's a question from the audience about the transatlantic alliance. Can you talk a little bit about NATO um, and, and uh, in the context of COVID and, Bre and Brexit and the current political climate? Yeah, first of all, I think that NATO has weathered a whole variety of different challenges, including successive administrations in the US, but particularly I would contend this one that question uh, why we're spending so much for the security of other people uh, a continent away who aren't spending as much of their GDP and aren't even in many cases uh, reaching the 2% of GDP level that was agreed by all of the leaders of these countries at the summit in the UK uh, a number of years ago. And those are legitimate issues. Uh, now, the fact has been uh, that NATO has this incredible new reason to live, uh, and they should be very thankful to Vladimir Putin for providing it. I mean, his aggressive actions um, in Crimea, Southeast Ukraine, Georgia, uh, threats to the Baltic states, uh, a lot of different issues with ships and, and aircraft that are conducting dangerous maneuvers, um, even just aggressive language, not to mention the adventurism in other places uh, in the greater region, if you look then at the greater Middle East, um, NATO has a new reason to live. Uh, and that has, together with coming out of the Euro uh, crisis and the encouragement from successive US presidents to meet the uh, standard that they established for each other of 2% of GDP. And in fact, just this week, I think Germany raised its defense spending by 10%, which is a very significant uh, increase. This may still not get them to 2% 2, 2 of GDP, but certainly headed in the right direction. The challenge now is going to be that in the wake of this crisis, every country in the world, certainly every country in NATO, will have taken on an enormous additional debt. As I mentioned, nearly $3 trillion of additional deficit spending uh, in a year where the deficit was already going to have been a trillion dollars. And uh, ultimately, that is going to put pressure on all discretionary line items. Uh, and if you recall that that is roughly a $1.2 uh, trillion dollar amount of money, 740 billion of that is defense in the US. So there's going to be pressure on the defense budgets, we assessed that there was going to be pressure even before uh, this additional enormous unprecedented amount of spending. That's going to be the context, I fear, uh, in which we'll be operating in the years and possibly decades that lie ahead. Um, but noting that NATO has made some very substantial gains in recent years. Um, this is a case where you want to certainly listen to the you know, read the social media, read the tweets, but follow the troops, the money, and the policy. Um, and if you do that, uh, you'll see that there are troops from many different uh, NATO nations, including the U.S. in the Baltic states now. There is a U.S. armor brigade back on European soil for the first time uh, in a number of years. Much of it is out in eastern Poland. There are efforts. There's two new headquarters uh, for NATO itself. Uh, one is a maritime headquarters, which went away with the end of the Cold War, is now back. Another is to 
uh, work the logistical issues to get all of the troops and everything else from Western Europe to Eastern Europe uh, if that is required. Um, there's a whole host of different initiatives. And then, as I said, not just the U.S. spending vastly more on defense, which has helped to remedy a lot of the, uh, the ills that had accumulated during the, the enormously high temp tempo of operations uh, during the post 9-11 wars. Um, and we've seen similar increases in spending uh, among the bulk of our NATO allies with the number getting to 2% uh, increasing each year. So we have several questions on Afghanistan um, and, the, and the peace deal in Afghanistan. So how do you view that peace deal? Um, what are the U.S. interests in Afghanistan today? And do you think the U.S. presence can end and should end? Well, first of all, those who want to dig more into this, go to foreignaffairs.com and Google Petraeus uh, on Afghanistan with Vance Surchuk, a colleague of mine uh, for quite some time. Uh, we just wrote a recent piece, I think it was about a, now it might be a month and a half or two months ago. As you all know, you lose track of time in these Groundhog Day experiences uh, that we're going through. Um, I always start when talking about Afghanistan by noting that we went to Afghanistan for a reason, to eliminate the sanctuary that was enjoyed by Al Qaeda under Taliban rule, in which the 9-11 attacks were planned, in which the initial training of the attackers was conducted. We have stayed for a reason, and that is to prevent Al Qaeda from reestablishing that sanctuary in roughly the same general area of Afghanistan, Eastern Afghanistan, uh, and now to do the same with the Islamic State, which has an affiliate in the Afghanistan Pakistan region as well. And they have both tried. There's something very attractive to them. It's a, it escapes me, but there is something about that part of Afghanistan that really appeals to them. Um, and we are certainly trying to enable our Afghan partners to uh, exercise more of the security for themselves. I mean, the fact is that we are probably now down below 10,000 troops. If U.S. and additional several thousand uh, NATO troops, contrast that with the 100,000 U.S. and 50,000 NATO and other coalition members forces that were there when I was privileged to be the commander. We're also there because it does provide a very important platform for the regional counterterrorism campaign. Let's not forget that the operation that brought Osama bin Laden to justice was conducted from, it's well known, uh, Eastern Afghanistan. I happened to be the commander in Afghanistan that night, although JSOC that night worked directly for the CIA director, but certainly we were monitoring it very, very closely because of the potential uh, contingencies into which we might have been uh, brought as a result of that. So that's why we went and why we have stayed. Um, I believe that if you can achieve a forced posture that is sustainable in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure, that you ought to sustain it. Um, this is a you know, there's a number of things we've learned about Islamist extremists uh, since 9-11. Um, very quickly, the first of those is that they will exploit ungoverned spaces in the Muslim world. The second is you have to do something about it because Las Vegas rules don't apply in these areas. What happens there doesn't stay there. They tend to view violence, extremism, and that tsunami of refugees I talked about, not just into neighboring countries, but all the way into our NATO allies uh, in Europe. The third is that generally we have to lead. We want a coalition, but the capabilities we have are so vastly greater that we have to bring those to bear. And they are turning out to be really important uh, in allowing us to operate without large forces on the ground, but to enable uh, substantial host nation forces. I'm talking about drones, the intelligence surveillance reconnaissance assets, and so forth, precision uh, airstrike, and so on. Fourth is you have to have a comprehensive campaign uh, to counter terrorists. You just can't counter them with counter terrorist force operations alone. And the fifth is this is a generational struggle. You therefore have to have a sustained commitment, uh, but it can only be sustained if it's sustainable. I would contend that we have achieved a sustainable level of forces in terms of cost and blood. Look, my view has been that we should have a strategy for staying, not for going. Interestingly, if you have a strategy for going, I think the enemy might actually be more willing to have reasonable negotiations. 
which is not the case if they know that you want to leave and you're negotiating from a position that is much less strong than otherwise would be the case. If you read the article, uh, we lay out a number of different issues that certainly should be called into question about this agreement um, and the the imprecision, the lack of precision about a lot of the different provisions in it. <clears throat> and even the curious fact that there are two annexes that are classified and are known only to our enemy, the Taliban and ourselves, and are not releasable to the American public, which again is a, an interesting facet of this particular agreement. So I just want to um, point everyone to the chat function that Amanda has put a link to that article. In, um, so you can all check it out. I would encourage everyone to, to read that. So we have, a, um, a, again, a bunch of questions about Iraq as well. Um, in, that's so, quick work, Amanda. <laughs> so everyone's, everyone's clicking on it now. Um, so can you comment about the situation on, in Iraq currently? Well, the situation in Iraq is very, very challenging indeed. Um, you have maybe first and fo foremost the now enormous economic collapse, given that it's a country that depends by and large on the export of crude oil. And of course, crude oil prices have absolutely collapsed around the world as a result of an inability uh, of OPEC to get Russia to continue the reduction in supply. The markets were flooded just at the time when demand collapsed by 30% due to the coronavirus shutdowns around the world. So the price of oil, again, has not gone, it actually did go through the floor on futures prices. You may recall there was that curious price one day of minus $37 for oil. In other words, you have to pay them $37 to get them to take it. That was an aberration, but still historically low, uh, certainly in, in recent years. <clears throat> Huge impact on what Iraq can therefore do for its people. Second, um, they've been operating with a caretaker prime minister for now not a year, but it's certainly well over half a year as three different prime minister candidates have been designated, two previous ones unable to form a government. In other words, unable to assemble a team of ministers uh, that would get the requisite votes in the Council of Representatives, the Iraqi parliament, to approve a new government. Uh, there, are, there is hope that the current uh, candidate can do that, touch wood, it'll happen here in the next week or so. Um, and that's crucially important because obviously you cannot take the big reforms, the big changes, address the serious and most difficult issues with a caretaker government. The third issue, of course, is that you have Iran, which would like to Lebanonize Iraq. And by that, I mean that they want to do in Iraq what they've done in Lebanon, which is to establish huge clout on the street, muscle, if you will, in the form of militias that they fund, train, equip, and even direct in many cases to be the equivalent of Lebanese Hezbollah, and then to have corresponding uh, clout in the parliament, uh, considerable, or similar to what has been achieved in Lebanon as well, where the Hezbollah coalition has at the least a blocking veto, if not more. In fact, they will be the anchor of the government that is in, in place and in trying to deal with their economic financial uh, collapse. And they'd like to do the same in Iraq. So that is yet another challenge and that these militias, which were given license to be back on the streets in uniform with weapons when the Islamic State threatened the very outskirts of Baghdad, um, are really not completely under the uh, authority and uh, control of the Ministry of Defense. And that is an issue that has to be dealt with as well. As you know, a government has to have the monopoly on the use of force uh, in a country. And if you don't, then you have a serious issue that you have to resolve. So they've got all of these challenges at the same time. And of course, the pandemic is making its ugly face known there as well. Although touch wood, nowhere near as bad yet, certainly as it has been in Iran, which has been incredibly inept in dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and has sustained very, very substantial losses 
uh, to their ruling class as well as to the everyday citizens. So before I go to the last question, someone, want, someone from the audience wants to know, what are you reading now? What would you recommend? Believe it or not, I was actually rereading the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, but it's an annotated version by a professor at West Point of 20 years now, Professor Elizabeth Salmon. It is a spectacular volume. Um, and don't be scared by its daunting size. Uh, it looks like a doorstop, but it is incredibly accessible. And what I like about that is how much additional information she provides about the context of the times to illuminate what it is that he's saying in his wonderfully plain spoken manner, uh, writing the greatest memoirs, I think many agree, uh, of any US general in history. So that's one that has really had me again, in part because I just interviewed her uh, again for the Grant Monument Association annual celebration of Grant's birthday, which was obviously done virtually, not at the Grant Monument Association or in the annual dinner. So for the last question, so as we go through the weeks and months and years ahead, how can we all be preparing for the next big one, whatever that next big one might be? Well, I think, again, as you look back on this, um, I think we obviously underestimated the potential for real havoc, uh, perhaps because of the SARS experience and the H1N1 and Ebola, all these other cases. Um, I don't know that I would describe it as just luck, but we managed very early on in each of those they were so manageable in terms of numbers that could be identified and then contact tracing and then the isolation and so forth that they never actually spread uh, the way the coronavirus has done so horrifically. Um, and I guess it might be time to go back and look at the Director of National Intelligence's annual threats assessment uh, and really ask ourselves whether we have prepared adequately uh, for all of these different threats. Uh, I mean, it's pretty clear that there were some uh, significant shortcomings when it came to certain aspects of this, uh, even again, aside from the issue of when we should have locked down or not, and, and when we should have begun taking certain uh, precautions and preparatory steps. So I guess that would be the answer. Um, this was actually not a black swan. Uh, this was not something that no one saw coming. This is something that actually is in the DNI's uh, in assessment, the, the published one every year. Um, and I guess we probably need, we owe it to our, our country and our world to go back and look real hard at that and ask whether we are sufficiently ready uh, for all of the other ones in there. And then also ask what do we need to do before the next time what big ideas need to be refined um, and then implemented uh, so that we're better prepared for the next go around of this, which again, if this mutates or if it dies away and then comes back with the flu season, um, those preparations might be tested sooner than we thought. Sir, thank you so much for joining us today. And I want to- Pleasure is mine, thank you. And Great thank to be back with you. Uh, we're, and I look forward to a time where we can actually welcome you back in person. That would be great. So, Puka. <laughs> absolutely. <Okay. laughs> you, you sure he was there. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for this um, for this episode today and for attending uh, C by C Amplified. You can find out so much more about all of the events this week at um, the letter C X C Amplified dot com. World Affairs Councils from all around the country are uh, have great events, and I hope you'll check them out. And I hope you'll support your local council, General. Thank you so much again, and you stay safe and well. My pleasure. Thank you.